Welcome to worship, our online version of it at the Lutheran Church of Del Rapids. I'm Pastor Jeff Sorensen and Pastor Eldon Thurow will be assisting with worship today as well as our worship team and lots of folks helping to bring this to you and we, and we give them thanks for that. Bob Harms, our chair of our stewardship committee, will be bringing you a report of our unbound stewardship appeal and the generosity of our people, of our congregation, and plans for next year and supporting, continuing to support very generously the work that we do together. A word for you is that you can see that we are decorated in our sanctuary with a beautiful this year a poinsettias. Um, we still have a number of those. If any of you would like to purchase one and dedicate in honor or memory of somebody, uh, just call the church office or step in and sign up for one, and uh, you'd be able to take it home immediately after the Christmas Eve worship. But they're gorgeous, and uh, we give thanks for you in providing them. Theme for today is the power of hope in our life, especially we talk about the light of Christ as we hear from John in the first chapter of his gospel. Welcome to worship. Please be safe. Hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall blossom and bloom like the crocus it shall blossom abundantly. And rejoice with joy and singing. They shall see the glory of the Lord the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear, here is your God. In God's time of joy, all sorrow and, si and sighing will leave us as we wait faithfully for the fulfillment of God's time. We light then the candles of hope Peace and joy. Light three candles to watch for Messiah. Let the light banish darkness. Lift your heads and lift high the gateway for the King of Glory. on a weary world when eyes begin to see all people's dignity light dawns on a weary world the promised day of justice comes the trees shall clap their hands the dry lands gush with springs the hills and mountains shall break forth with singing. We shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace as all the world in wonder echoes shalom. Love grows in a weary world when hungry hearts find bread and children's dreams are fed. Love grows in a weary world. The promised feast of plenty comes. The trees shall clap their hands, and dry lands gush with spring. The hills and mountains shall break forth with singing. We shall go led forth in peace as all the world in wonder echoes shalom hope blooms in a weary world when creatures once forlorn find wilderness reborn hope blooms in a weary world the promised green of trees shall clap their hands, the dry lands gush with springs, the hills and mountains shall break forth with singing. We shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. And 
Tears o'er the world in wonder echoes Shalom Let us pray. O oh God, from ages past, when your people walked in darkness, you promised a Messiah, the hope of our world, who would one day lighten our darkness and destroy its power over us. Continue to assure us, we pray, as even this day we too await the celebration of the birth of your only Son, Jesus among us. May the hope of the light to come turn all human hearts to you. Amen. It had been centuries of darkness since any prophetic word of hope or light had been spoken to the people of Israel. Six centuries, 600 years ago Israel because of their failure to follow the and live up to the covenants with God was in captivity in Babylon back in Jerusalem the the city was in shambles the temple was a smoldering ruin the people were now in servitude in a foreign land the prophets had spoken into that darkness even of that that despairing time of hope in God's time for redemption. A promise of one to come, a Messiah, the hope of the world who would one day lighten the darkness and destroy its power over us. The prophet Isaiah in that time wrote chapter 60 saying, For darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise among you and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. But now, all these centuries later, Israel had returned to the land, but they were still captive all of those centuries by Babylon, captive then to Assyria, and now by the Roman Empire. No further word had come to them from the prophets of God and they were still living with this thick, heavy darkness over the people. And hope, hope of one to come, a light in that darkness, had for most of Israel given way to hopelessness and despair. It was into those dark days now that spoke John the Baptist of the light the light that now had come. I read for you from the first chapter of John, verses 6 to 18. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He, John himself, was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own and his own people did not accept him, but to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law, indeed, was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. The hope of one to come, 
long promised the arrival of this true light in its all its power to dispel the darkness. Now as promised announced John the Baptist coming into the world. And to those in this dark world, he said, who will receive him and believe in his name, he gives power. The power of hope. He gives power to become children of God. This word of God becoming flesh in a human child born in Bethlehem, now living among us, full of the grace and truth of God. Those are beautiful words from John. But how can such words of promise in such a dark time actually inspire belief and hope after all those centuries of silence and darkness? Our question for us of this day, when we too know the foreboding power of darkness in our day, in our time, in our lives, how does the light of Christ how does, how does light, how does, like hope, how does it have power to overcome darkness? A story. Some years ago when our son Jory was in the fourth grade, I know it was then because it was in the fall just after he had begun junior football. He had some friends over for a birthday party and he took them out into the pasture behind our house, out behind the trees, in the dark. He wanted to play what he called flashlight football. So it's pitch dark, um, where you can't see anything out there without lights, and they had their flashlights turned off. And as they're walking in the dark, one of his friends who's from town, where the lights of the city are on all the time, looked up and pointed to the sky and said, what's that? And Jory looked up and he said, stars? And the kid said, wow, we don't have stars like that in town. At which my fourth grade son puffed out his chest and said, welcome to my world. <laughs> I love the story. It speaks to the goodness of raising kids where we can see stars at night. But to the point for our message about the power of light and hope over darkness is that it's only in the darkness that we see those stars. That the darker the night, the more powerful are the stars' light. An important book from my seminary days, when I was training to be a pastor, a classic yet today, is Lighten My Darkness by Douglas John Hall. Lighten Our Darkness. Hall's important point is that how our spiritual lives can be hollow, they can be empty, they can be shallow, until we're able to name and acknowledge how oppressive and difficult for us is the darkness that inevitably sometimes we find ourselves in. But that for acknowledging that darkness, it gives even more power to the light of Christ in our lives to overcome that darkness. Lighten our darkness. I remember a devotional around the campfire at Camp Nisadak as we looked out across the lake in the dark of the night. The counselor had put out the campfire, so we sat there in the dark, a very dark night. The moon was not yet up. But across the lake, we could see lights shining on the opposite shore. And our leader asked, how far away are those lights? And he asked, if those lights weren't there, but we were in total darkness, if someone sat on that opposite shore two miles away and said, only with a single candle, do you think would we see that light? Well, yes. In darkness, but only in total darkness, the human eye will see a single candlelight for three miles. And that's only limited to those three miles by the, by the curvature of the earth. And earth, if the earth was flat, or if that, that candle was high up on a mountain so we could see that light, we can see that candle in its light up to 30 miles. 
but only in total darkness. Light has that much power over darkness. Try this yourself sometime. Take a flashlight or your cell phone light out into the dark. It lights up the dark so you can see. But does the darkness have any power over that light to extinguish the light? No, none at all, none. No amount of darkness has any effect on that light. To the darker it is, in fact, the brighter that light shines. The light still shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Our question, how does the light of Christ, how does light, how does hope have power to overcome darkness? Another story. Some years ago, I was hunting with friends in the mountains of Colorado. I had walked, foolishly, I will say, uh, maybe five miles without a lot of equipment to keep myself safe. Out and up from our base camp beside a river. And that afternoon, a snowstorm came on, and I'm up a mountain five miles from camp. So I settled in under some trees and waited out the storm. When the snow stopped, I'm that far, five miles from camp, now with about two feet of snow, waist deep in some places, it's dark. My friends don't know where I am, it's getting cold, I have no light, and I have to get down that mountain to camp. I know I have to keep going down, and I know that I have to keep bearing right, but not too far, or I'll miss the camp. So down into the danger and into the darkness I go. I'm stumbling, I'm falling, I'm wet, I'm tired. I know that I have to keep going. And if not, it'll be spring before they found me on that mountain. So down, down into the darkness I go, miles down that mountain in absolute pitch black darkness. Until when I look up in the distance, yet about two miles away, I see a light. I see a light because my friends have started a fire to help me find camp should I see that light. And exhausted as I was, as tempted as I was in my fatigue to give out and to quit in that snow as I'm trudging along, there was now hope. I stumbled on because of that hope through the snow and the cold and stumbling and following and getting up again toward that light with hope that there at that light was shelter and warmth and hope that came with that light. I stumbled into camp. I opened the tent flap. I flopped down exhausted, thoroughly wet onto my cot. I slept straight through for 24 hours and returned home in safety. All because of the hope that came into that darkness with that light. Into the darkness of the people of Israel and the silence of the prophets since the promise of the Messiah some 600 years before that the light of the world would come. Yet there were some in Israel who continued to hope that the light would appear. All there was, was this distant promise. But for some, it was enough to trust that in God's good time, that promised light would someday shine. And that night, that night at that very dark time in Israel's history, appeared to the shepherds in the darkened hills near Bethlehem, angels shining in the night, proclaiming the birth in a stable below of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And in that night, in the darkness of that time, appeared a star, a light in the sky to sages in a distant land, who then followed that light by night, 
only by night when in darkness it could be seen. Those sages saying, where is the child who's been born king of the Jews? For we have observed, we have seen his star, the light at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. Here's an interesting side note. I find this interesting. As Israel sat in darkness all those centuries, awaiting the arrival of this light as promised so many years ago, I wondered, and so I looked it up. How long does it take for the light that is generated by a star to reach our eyes here on earth? How long does it take that star's light generated there to reach those sages to follow it to where the Christ child lay? Well, the North Star, which is one of the brightest stars in the sky and often used to navigate, to get from it, that light to be seen by the human eye on earth takes 434 years for that light generated there by God to get here. It took centuries, but that light did shine. So back to our question, how does the light of Christ, how does light, how, how does hope have power for us, yet even today, to overcome our darkness. Not just 2,000 years ago for shepherds or sages, but today for us, how does light of Christ provide hope for us? You know what just a spark of light can do to rekindle hope when in the darkness our hope has dwindled or has died out. This is a very current illustration. This cloud of COVID that we've lived under since March, a kind of shroud and darkness some of us have suffered with, some of us have died of, all of us are so very tired of. But even now just this week, just a spark of light, just a spark with the announcement that vaccines are on the way, even if for most of us they're months away, what has that done for you? I know what it's done for me. We can't see the light yet at the end of this long yet tunnel. Most of us are not going to be vaccinated for some time, but even just knowing it may be there, that small light out there, just months away, gives us hope. It's hope. You know we do feel, don't we, more hopeful. Even as with increasing numbers the danger grows and we have to even to be more careful, we do feel a glimmer of hope. Knowing that the light will someday come. That's what hope is. Hope is a promise of redemption, a promise of healing, a promise of life, even in the shroud of darkness that could otherwise overwhelm. That's what light does. For much more than COVID, our, our trouble of the day. But it's what light does when we know the darkness. It shines in the darkness, light does. It shines in the darkness of our sin. The light shines in the darkness of our rebellion from God. It shines in the dark of our despair. It shines even over death in its penultimate power over life. Penultimate. Because even death does not have the last word. But life reigns in the promises of God. Our hope, our hope to cling to of life to come. I'll read you now the first part of the gospel, verses 1 to 5 of the first chapter of John, this promise announced by John of the arrival, the birth of the light of Christ, hope, the power of hope, born among us. John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. And then these gorgeous words which are our hope for all time to come. In whatever darkness might overwhelm, John writes, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The darkness did not overcome it. Thanks be to God. Amen. Longing for light, we wait in darkness. Longing for truth, we turn to you. Make us your own, your holy people. Light for the world. the whole church, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Join us, please, uh, in the prayers of the people. We pray. Oh God, help us, we pray, to cling to your sure promise of light. That light that comes among us in your Son, Jesus Christ, to overcome all darkness that may shroud our world and tempt us to doubt you and your power over it. Give us, we pray, hope. Keep us hopeful 
as we await the celebration of the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, among us. We pray, O oh God, your mercy for all those this day that live in darkness or despair, who are struggling with needs of health or mind or spirit. We pray especially for those that we have named as their lames have risen among us or those that we might name quietly in our hearts today, O oh God, for Joanne Park and for Rich Holt, but also, O oh God, for the family of Elaine Bacher, who's laid to rest this week. We give you thanks, O oh God, for all who give of themselves to risk their safety in order to protect us. For all of our frontline healthcare workers and firefighters and police and military, O oh God, for all of those who work to keep your people safe, um, keep them safe and all of us as well, we pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, that we are privileged to participate in the work of your people through the St. Ismus Prison Congregation and Church on the Street and the banquet here in Sioux Falls, of the Pine Ridge and Two Strike Ministries in South Dakota, of our friends of the Lutheran Church of Faith and Hope in Nicaragua, and of all of the work of your people of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and all of your people everywhere. May we, with our voices and our hands and our lives, be that light of hope for all your world. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we command all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we were gathered here in the sanctuary, we would at this time be receiving the offering. Uh, we encourage you to continue to send in your offering, bring it in and put it in the box, uh, the slot there in the narthex. Uh, we just want to sincerely thank you for the way that you have so uh, abundantly continued to support the ministry of the congregation. Thank you. At this time, if you are uh, prepared to uh, share communion in your home with your family, you have the words of institution that were sent to you, and uh, you have the elements prepared, you may at this time pause the recording and commune your family there together. Let us pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
flame burns bright Oh, the light shines in the darkness And the light will not be overcome In this world broken and scattered The light will not be As we conclude our worship, go in peace. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Thanks be to God. Amen.